Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. So I'm actually going to start off um, with this session. My name's Hannah Wilkins. I'm a paediatric um, respiratory physio from Southampton and my spe um, I work for the PCD specialist team down there. And then later on, you're going to be hearing also from um, Lynn Schofield. She's one of the paediatric PCD physios um, up in Leeds. And then Liz, you'll be um, meeting as well. And she's um, one of the fairly newly appointed adult PCD physios uh, down here in uh, Southampton, although she worked for many years in CF. So, um, you know, I've worked with her for a while, so it's great to have her here as well. So when Lucy mentioned about um, doing a physio related topic, um, I mean, we always talk about airway clearance, don't we? And I think people are a little bit bored sometimes with us going on and on about airway clearance. Um, so we thought this was a really interesting topic that, um, that has become a bit of a hot topic really um, over this pandemic. Um, the number of times that I've um, opened the newspaper and there's been an article about um, breathing pattern disorders or how to breathe better. It seems to, I don't know whether I'm just looking out for it and whether I'm interested in it. And so suddenly it's become uh, kind of something that's um, been talked about a lot, but we thought it was a really interesting topic. Um, and uh, for most of you, some of you might know a lot about breathing pattern disorders or hyperventilation. There's lots of names that we'll talk about later. Um, hopefully by the end of this session, you'll have a little bit more of an idea what we're talking about. Um, so there's lots and lots of different words, bandages around, which kind of mean the same sort of thing. But for most of you, you'll have all kind of your, um, I, I guess, experience or your understanding, your thoughts around dysfunctional breathing or hyperventilation is this picture of this man here breathing into a paper bag. It's not actually a treatment that we advocate or that we do, but I thought it was a good one to put in there in the fact that it's, it's something that probably you can relate to. So uh, we'll start off. So next slide, please, Liz. So this is just a quick session outline. We're going to have a little look about how we, how, how we breathe um, and uh, what's a good breathing pattern, what we need in terms of um, some muscle activity and kind of um, the body, um, you know, the muscles and what, what we need to be able to breathe well. Uh, we're going to have a look at what goes, what can happen when it goes wrong. And we're going to just have a little reflection on um, PCD um, and just have a look at actually how it relates to PCD maybe. And then we're going to finish off with um, this section of the, the talk about um, what we can do to sort of help and what you can do and, um, and how us as physios, we, you know, we're interested in what we can do to help you. Uh, and then after that, we're going to have the three breakout rooms that Lucy's already talked about. So that's going to be, I think it's 15 minutes of session where we can actually be, um, look at the practicalities of actually maybe teaching a few techniques or giving you a few ideas of things that you could be thinking about. Um, and then, of course, as Lucy already said, we're going to be finishing with sort of the questions and time of reflection. Um, so next slide. Okay, so um, feeling well is more reliant on a good breathing pattern than many, many people realise. Um, and today we just want to think about kind of um, how our bodies were designed to breathe and how bad breathing habits can happen over time. And they can, they can lead to a whole multitude of different strange symptoms. Um, and it's kind of relevant to all of us. Like I said, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of talk during this pandemic about breathing. Um, and what we hope today actually um, gives you is just a little bit of, you can actually think about your own breathing patterns and see if it's something that's actually relevant to you. And if it is something relevant, then actually you can maybe go to your physio afterwards and you can actually have a bit more of a conversation about, about this, um, another, another point. Um, now, if you're like me, I've never really, up until doing my physio degree, I never really thought much about my breathing. I just breathe. Of course, I've been breathing all my life. Of course, my breathing is normal. Um, and then suddenly uh, I started my physio degree. And one day we had this talk about diaphragmatic breathing and learning a whole practical session all afternoon where we had to sit and we had to practice this diaphragmatic breathing, which I remember being really tricky. And then it's funny, actually, um, that was probably a telltale sign for me then that I had a slight this functional breathing pattern myself. And uh, now, um, many years later, I can actually reflect on times in my life when um, particularly I remember uh, A-levels and um, I also remember around the time of my, um, my final year sort of degree exams and things like that, when actually I developed some very strange symptoms. And now, actually, many years later, I can reflect back on that and realise that it was actually to do with my breathing, even though I'd never have guessed that at the time. So what we'd like to do first of all is just have a little think and a little bit of reflection on, um, on your own breathing. 
So if you're a, a parent of a child, you might want to think about your child's breathing, or you might want to think about your own breathing, or, um, um, you know, so this is time just to sort of have a little think and think about how you breathe. So I've just put a few little things to think about here. And of course, as soon as I've, we've started talking about breathing, your breathing patterns have probably all changed. And so it might be a time, you might have to actually ask uh, maybe a, a partner or uh, maybe uh, a good friend or maybe even a certain, you know, or ask your parents actually a little bit about um, how you breathe. Um, so to have a little think about when you're sitting and resting, do you breathe through your nose or do you breathe through your mouth? Can you hear your breathing? Is that something that you're aware of quite often, sort of noisy, noisy breathing? Uh, now this one, we're not gonna kind of, it's, it's one to just think about how fast you breathe, um, but I'm not gonna time you for a minute and ask you to, to count how many breaths you do, because um, I'm sure it will be, because like I say, uh, as soon as we start talking about breathing, you change your breathing straight away. But think about how many breaths you take in one minute and, and how fast you breathe. And then I just wonder if you can just pop your hand, so one hand on your tummy and maybe one hand on your upper chest. So, so in this position here, and maybe just think about where you're breathing from. So where can you feel the movement? So can you feel um, movement from up here in the top of your chest or can you feel movement from down here, so your abdominal area? And then another little thing to think about is whether sighing is something you do quite a lot. Has anybody ever told you that you sigh a lot or are you aware of sighing a lot? Okay, so while you're thinking about that, we're just going to have a little look next about, so if uh, Liz can put the next slide on. So what is good breathing? So good breathing is efficient breathing, which means that really it shouldn't take much effort to do. It should be subconscious. You shouldn't have to think about it too much. It should be effortless. It should be relaxed. It should be quiet. And of course, when you breathe, you take in oxygen into your body and then use all that oxygen. Um, and then carbon dioxide, you breathe out carbon dioxide, which is the waste gas of breathing. And uh, the body is very clever at regulating this uh, level of oxygen and level of carbon dioxide in your body. Um, and it's amazing, actually, you don't need to be able to take a lot of air into the body um, to get the oxygen that you need. Uh, the body is surprisingly efficient with oxygen, so you don't need to be gulping in lots of air um, to, to get um, more oxygen into your body. And it's funny, unless you have any kind of um, medical condition, actually up to, until the age of about three, most little children, actually, their breathing is very normal and they breathe, they breathe well. But it's when other start stresses start coming into your life and you start school and you know things start happening that actually that's when we start to kind of potentially develop bad habits. Um, having said that, if you do have a you know if you have a lung condition, then um, potentially I guess abnormal breathing could start before then. Right, next slide. So the next few slides we're going to have a look at little bit of a look at the different bits of the body that are particularly important to make sure you breathe well. So um, your diaphragm is really important for breathing. Um, we're going to talk about more about that in a minute. Use other muscles as well. So some of the muscles in your shoulders, between your ribs, but your diaphragm is by far the most important muscle for breathing. Um, breathing through your nose is also quite an important thing. Um, you need to be able to move your lower ribs. Um, a normal breathing rate for an adult is between 12 and 16 breaths a minute. Um, at rest, but of course it's faster in children and in little, you know, the younger you are, the faster your breathing rate will be. Um, and like I say, breathing should be quiet. So next slide. So we'll talk about the diaphragm next. So in normal breathing, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the work of breathing is done by the diaphragm. Like I say, there are a few other muscles that come into play and, but they generally at rest, it should be mainly the diaphragm that's doing all the work. But um, the other muscles, um, when you're exercising, for instance, and you need to take bigger breaths in, then actually the other muscles come into play. But um, the diaphragm, I don't know if you know much about it. It's, um, it's a large, strong, flat-shaped muscle, which is attached to the lower edge of the ribs and the spine. And it's made up of muscle fibers that are for strength and endurance, um, just to keep going. Um, the diaphragm sits below your lungs so below your chest below your lungs and heart uh, this big flat muscle 
and um, and above it's sort of, it um, it splits your chest really from your abdominal contents in your your um, your guts your your uh, digestive system. Now, when your diaphragm is relaxed, it's the shape of a dome of an umbrella, so it's dome shaped. Um, and then when you need to breathe, take a breath in, it contracts. And what it does is it flattens down, see it sort of flattens down, and really it pushes the abdominal contents down and out. Um, so when we talk about belly breathing and actually where the movement's coming from, what it's actually showing us is the where the diaphragm's working well. So the diaphragm, it yeah, it flattens down, it pushes the abdominal contents. And because your spine behind and your ribs at the side, really the abdominal contents can't, they can, they, you can, or your, you know, your digestive system, you can get some movement sideways, but the majority of movement is going to be forwards um, uh, into your tummy um, as the diaphragm pushes down and out. And then, of course, as you breathe out, the diaphragm actually can, it then sort of relaxes and goes into a dome shaped again and, and the air, um, uh, and then you expire, you breathe out. So that's the diaphragm. Um, and like I say, with exercise and things like that, so during exercise and increased activity, the upper chest also opens up a bit and draws the extra air that it needs in. So the next slide is a bit about the nose. Um, now the nose is really important as well, because what the nose does is it actually encourages diaphragmatic breathing. It controls how fast and deep we breathe, and it helps to ensure a slow, more regular breathing pattern. If you can imagine the amount of air that you breathe in through your mouth, so you can gulp air in, so you can take far too much air in through your mouth, but from your nose, actually, um, you can't take as much, you know, the, the, um, because it, the nose, nose passages are much smaller, then of course, um, you don't take as much air, but you take in the amount of air you, you need that you need you need uh, the nose also acts as a filter which um, traps small particles such as pollen and dust with all those little hairs in your nose um, another job of the nose is it warms the air that you breathe in it humidifies it so it moistens it it warms it um, ready for our lungs to you know to receive that air um, and it stops you know our um, it prevents sort of dryness in the airways and the lungs really um, and nitric oxide is another thing that you might have heard something. It obviously has something a little bit to do with PCD as well. But actually, um, nitric oxide is produced in the nose. And this has a, a role in immunity and fighting infections and things like that. So we won't talk too much anymore about that at the moment, but it's just something of interest. Uh, so next slide. So um, the final thing I was just going to say is also what you also need to breathe well is you need a chest wall that moves well. So you need to be fairly supple. Um, you need, you know, your ribs to be able to move um, outwards and inwards. And you know, um, so basically, the ribs need to move well. You need to be supple. Um, your muscles shouldn't be too tight. Um, and you need diaphragm, the room for the diaphragm to move downwards. So when it moves down, so for instance, in pregnancy, that's always a bit of a tricky one because of course you've got this baby pushing up in your diaphragm, and it, it's, you know, it's very difficult for the diaphragm to to be able to 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 move properly and efficiently as it, it should do. Um, so that's, I think that's the end of the kind of what we need to breathe well and normal breathing. At this point, I think I'm handing over to Lynn and she will talk you through a little bit about what can go wrong. Hi, hopefully uh, my uh, computer is all working well. Um, could you move on to the next slide for me, please? Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about dysfunctional breathing, and this is a bit of a funny term, and it might feel like a bit of an alien term, um, and just to kind of unpick this a little bit. So basically, um, it means that all of the things that Hannah's talked about, all of those important things that we need to breathe really easily and to, for our breathing to work really efficiently, something doesn't kind of work right. So something doesn't work as it should do. And normally this is something that's happened over a long period of time. And sometimes it can just be something that happens really subtly. So you may not notice um, for a long time that this has just been maybe gradually building up. And then it's only once it starts to cause you some symptoms that you that it becomes apparent to you. Um, 
A common part of um, breathing abnormally is over breathing, so um, breathing too much. And we'll talk a little bit more in depth about that. But this breathing differently can cause a range of symptoms that can feel like breathing symptoms, so like respiratory symptoms. But it can also feel like um, symptoms in other parts of your body, which may seem um, some of the, the symptoms that we'll go through today, you'll be maybe surprised that they can be connected and caused by breathing differently. Um, but it really can have a, a, a quite a widespread effect on your body that we'll, um, we'll have a talk about. But sometimes people that have dysfunctional breathing will have had lots of different tests that um, don't kind of identify anything that's medically causing them um, but it can be attributed by this to sort of this different breathing pattern um, next slide please so dysfunctional breathing is kind of the current name for this and there's been lots of different names for kind of the same thing over a long period of time so you may recognize some of the the words that are on the screen as, as different terms. And, and this is really kind of just a mixed bag and a bit of an umbrella term of, of different features of kind of the same thing. And I'm sure at some point the name of this will change again, but at the moment, this is kind of the term by which it's known. Next slide, please. Um, so as I said, that a, a big part of um, overbreathing, um, a big part of dysfunctional breathing is overbreathing. So as Hannah described, we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is a waste product. So yes, it's one that we want to get rid of, but our body needs a certain level of carbon dioxide to function normally. And if we have too little carbon dioxide, it can cause a bit of a stress response in our body. So it can trigger adrenaline um, and lots of different symptoms. So your body kind of goes into a bit of a, almost a, a, a fight, a bit of a defensive kind of mode. So you may feel that your breathing gets faster, that your chest tightens, that your heart is racing, you feel a little bit dizzy, almost that kind of panic response. And, and lots of different things can cause those symptoms, but they can also be caused just by not having enough carbon dioxide. And we may think about hyperventilation as the stuff that you see on TV programs or in films where somebody has something scary happen and they breathe really fast and you see them breathing into a paper bag. And that's when it happens um, like really acutely in a really short space of time. But what more commonly what happens in this condition is that people over breathe a tiny bit all of the time and that that really adds up to um, bring down your carbon dioxide levels to a point where if you then breathe a little bit more it brings on your symptoms so maybe when you exercise or you go up the stairs or you do lots of huffs and coughs to get rid of your phlegm but that extra bit of, of, of breathing more tips you into a point where you get these symptoms so it's really kind of just recognizing when this is happening and working out what we can do about it next slide please so there's lots of different things that can cause our breathing pattern to change and, and to not work as well as it could, as, as well, it, you know, potentially could do. So I'll just touch on a few of these that may kind of um, sound familiar. Um, so I guess um, stress and pain is something that is familiar to many of us at different part, at different times in our lives. And if we're stressed or we're in pain, it's a really normal response that your body will breathe faster. Um, and that can cause um, a bit of a different breathing pattern. Um, if we have poor posture, as Hannah mentioned, um, we need the, the muscles and the joints and the ribs and everything to work really well to breathe well. And actually, if we have a different posture, that can mean that our muscles can't work quite as well. So that can change your breathing pattern and make you more susceptible to these symptoms. Um, and certainly having an underlying respiratory condition. So something that means that you breathe a little bit differently, again, in itself predisposes you to having some of these symptoms. Um, and it may be that these are things that happen over a long period of time and that we get this gradual creep. Or sometimes there can be um, a point in time that we can pinpoint and say, actually, these symptoms have come on when I've had a chest infection and um, then I've breathed differently and it's all started from then or something stressful has happened in my home life. And that's kind of triggered things. So it can be both a really gradual onset or sometimes just something that comes on a bit more suddenly. Next slide, please. Um, and this slide is really just to indicate that um, breathing differently is like a really big umbrella and, and lots of people have lots of different features of breathing differently. So some people have more of the breathing related symptoms. Sometimes we'll notice more that 
the muscles people are using to breathe or the different parts of their chest can be abnormal. Sometimes it's more about the carbon dioxide levels and, and, and that element. Sometimes people may find that they have more symptoms that are associated with periods of stress. It really is um, quite a, a variety and people can have different features and different parts of things that we need to work on. And that's why we're really um, showing you, um, I guess, just how this can present but it's really important to have that individualized assessment with a physiotherapist so they can help to work out which part of this you may be struggling with or which part of the breathing chain isn't quite working efficiently for you and help to find ways to help you to address that and um, and improve that to make things work better for you um next slide and i'm handing over to liz thanks lynn so um this slide just shows a number of the symptoms that you can get uh, from having a breathing pattern disorder. Um, I think it just shows that there's an awful lot of symptoms and there's over 30 possible symptoms that have been recognised in um, relation to breathing pattern disorders. Um, and I'd encourage you just to have a look at some of these symptoms and see if you recognise any of these in yourself. Um, as you can see, some things like blurred vision, fatigue, uh, dizziness, cold hands, they, it's very difficult to know whether these symptoms have been caused by a breathing pattern disorder or by something else. For example, you could have cold hands and feet because you've got rhinos or something. Um, so it's not to say that just because you have these symptoms, you definitely have a breathing pattern disorder. It's more for you to think about um, could your symptoms be caused by um, a breathing pattern disorder, particularly um, if you have something like PCD? Um, and just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, if some of the symptoms, you would probably, I think, be quite surprised, for example, heartburn being caused by the breathing pattern disorder or um, the tingling in your um, toes and fingers or numbness. Um, so again, it's just having an awareness that things that you might not necessarily think, oh, well, that's caused by um, the way that I'm breathing might actually be attributed to different aspects of your breathing. So I'm sure um, one of the questions you want to know is how common are breathing pattern disorders? Well, it's very, very difficult to know. There's some research into this, but not a huge amount of research. Um, it's thought to affect between six and 10% of the population. But as we saw, it's quite difficult to say, oh, these symptoms are caused by a breathing pattern disorder. So that probably um, is an underrepresentation of the amount of people who actually have a breathing pattern disorder. Um, and uh, really, um, we don't totally know how many people are coming into hospital, for example, into A&E with um, tingling um, and, and um, sen strange sensations, and actually it isn't um, caused by, um, I don't know, some nerve damage. It, it, it's actually a breathing pattern disorder that's causing this. We do know that it's more common in certain respiratory conditions. So for example, um, asthma, um, it, it's estimated that about 32% of people with asthma have um, some kind of dysfunctional breathing. And we also know that it's more common in um, women. Um, it, it can be um, a standalone condition. So you can just have a breathing pattern disorder. You don't need to have a respiratory condition on top of it to get um, a dysfunctional breathing pattern. Um, but we do also see it quite frequently with um, respiratory conditions. So Asthma would be one of them, cystic fibrosis, PCD, um, COPD, things like that. Um, it, often you see it going alongside a respiratory condition. Um, and as Lynn was saying before, um, this is something that is often a chronic change in your breathing pattern. So it happens over a long period of time. And like many symptoms that you may get with your PCD, it can be really quite subtle and it just builds up very, very gradually. Um, and you may not really notice that it's happened. So um, often it's quite useful to 
speak to those who are around you who know you quite well um, who may be able to spot the changes um, better than you because you've just got used to breathing in a different way. We know that it is quite under-recognised um, and that's because you do need a degree of skill to be able to diagnose it and recognise it for what it is and also that it is it's hard to know whether the symptoms you're experiencing are from your breathing pattern disorder or um, if it's from a, your respiratory condition in general um, and we know that particularly in children it's quite hard to diagnose um, and it also depends on clinicians awareness so um, while some physiotherapists um, and doctors are going to be aware of this um, there are others who will um, be less aware of the signs and symptoms of breathing pattern disorders and dysfunctional breathing patterns. And um, it may not be the first thing that they think about when you present with your symptoms. And probably you're asking, well, can my PCD make me more likely to have a um, breathing pattern disorder? Well, <laughs> sadly, we don't really know the answer to that. We suspect that it it probably does um, and there's a number of reasons why that would be so so one of the things that's quite common in PCD is that you often find that you've got a blocked nose or a runny nose um, and that it can be quite difficult to breathe through your nose and as Hannah was saying before breathing through your nose really promotes that um, slow rhythmic breathing pattern um, and if you're unable to breathe through your nose, um, then that can make that more difficult. You can also get more short of breath in PCD, particularly if you have a chest infection, and that can alter how you breathe and the pattern of your breathing. You may also have um, altered biomechanics. So that would just mean that your muscles are maybe elongated or shortened around your chest wall. And that is just going to affect the way that your ribs move out, that your diaphragm moves and that the muscles move when you take that breath in and then that breath out. And so that can just make it slightly more difficult to have a normal breathing pattern. And then what we sometimes see in PCD that some of um, people with PCD also have a bit of an asthmatic component to their PCD. So maybe their um, the airways in their chest are a bit tight and a bit wheezy at some points. And again, that can make it a bit more difficult to have the normal breathing pattern that um, you would be aiming for. So how can physiotherapy help? Well, I think one of the really important things that we can do as physios is to reassure people, um, to reassure you that the maybe the strange and worrying symptoms that you're getting could be down to um, the way that you're breathing um, and that we can do something about this and that we can help you to do something about this. Um, we can help you to um, encourage you to breathe in, in what we would term a more normal breathing pattern. So that would be through your nose, using your diaphragm when you, rather than the muscles around your um, upper chest and your neck. Um, we can give you advice about breathing through your nose. Um, so thinking about doing things like sinus rinse to keep your nose and your sinus and nice and clear and make it easier for you to breathe through your nose. Um, we can offer you advice about um, your muscles and um, your chest wall shapes. Um, so thinking if your muscles are a bit tight around your chest or around your neck or um, down around your diaphragm, um, helping you to do some stretching with that, um, thinking about the positioning, so sitting upright um, and how you try and breathe um, when, you're, when you're thinking about your breathing to try and get it back into a um, less dysfunctional breathing pattern. And then we can also help you with probably what you're thinking about in terms of typical physio things. So thinking about using your inhalers, particularly if you've got sort of like an asthma -y component to your PCD. Um, thinking about using your NEBs so that you're clearing your chest out and your 
um, upper airways, so your nose. Um, so it makes it easier for you to breathe um, through your nose and into your lungs. And then thinking about doing your physio um, to make your chest nice and clear so that you can get the air down there and the air can come back out and it's not getting um, getting a bit of resistance from any um, sputum that might be lurking down there. And lastly, we can think with you to think about lifestyle management things. So uh, this might be really simple things to think about when do you tend to find that your breathing pattern alters a bit? Um, is there anything that we can do to help that? So a really common one would be, for example, if you um, find that you have to do a bit of public speaking um, and before you do the public speaking, you find that your breathing goes a bit strange and that you tend to be breathing more from your upper chest, um, which is probably anxiety related. So maybe thinking about doing some um, relaxation before you do that um, and just trying to think about your sleep patterns, what you're eating, what you're drinking, um, so that um, you're trying to optimise uh, your health as much as possible to make your breathing um, as easy and as um, into a normal breathing pattern. And then thinking um, for you about how you can help yourself. So I think Hannah has been through this at the beginning. So becoming aware of your own breathing and how it can vary um, depending on what situation you find yourself in. Um, you really want to think about how fast are you breathing? Where are you breathing from? And are there certain things, certain triggers um, that change that for you? It's quite, it can take quite a little while to work out the things that might be triggers for you. Um, particularly as, as soon as you start to think about your breathing, your breathing will, will automatically change um, and you tend to breathe faster anyway. So it's um, trying to sort of almost catch yourself unawares and think, oh, what's my breathing like now? Um, is this one of my triggers? Um, and what are the things that I'm maybe doing that may not be helping my breathing pattern? And then hopefully you will discuss this with your physio if you think that you may have a breathing pattern disorder um, or if you think that you'll, you've got some signs and symptoms that might suggest you've got a breathing pattern disorder and if they give you some exercises then like all physio exercises um, trying to practice them regularly and practice really is the key you don't need to do hours and hours and hours of practice for your breathing exercises it's more important that you do it um, often so trying to do it every half hour every hour um, whatever works for you um, and just to get your body used to breathing um, in a more normal way it will take time um, but practice is really going to help with that so that's the end of uh, the first bit of our presentation I'm going to stop sharing um, and then I think we're going to go into the three breakout rooms and, and uh, so thank you ever so much guys I uh, we've been away into our three breakout rooms and everyone's learned a little bit more about the age specific uh, elements of breathing pattern disorders and hopefully some really useful tips for being able to cope with these and to uh, identify them and uh, work around them um I'm opening up very quickly if this is okay with people for an five minutes now of uh, questions and answers. And of course, um, we will put our details in the chat um, if you want to send us questions at the end of the event. Um, I'll give you a couple of seconds to put some things in the chat if you want to ask them now, but I just wanted to uh, kick off with one um, question uh, to our physios. And I wonder, um, Liz, maybe, uh, I think this was on your section of the talk. You say about um, dysfunctional breathing where, uh, there's tests that maybe doesn't show that there's anything wrong. 
um, but there's all these symptoms. So obviously, if you're a patient that has a breathing pattern disorder, it can feel like there's something very wrong, can't it? That's quite a hard um, thing for patients, perhaps, to uh, work with, you know, where you feel like something is really, really wrong, but nothing's kind of coming up with answers. Um, do you sort of find that often? And how do you, how do you sort of advise people uh, talk to their physios about, about these kind of problems to help them kind of understand what's going on? Um, yes, so there's, um, there's not many, well, there's certainly not like a gold standard test that would say, oh, this is definitely a breathing pattern disorder. Um, and I think one of the hard things is that the symptoms that may suggest you've got um, some kind of dysfunctional breathing pattern could also be symptoms of other things. Um, so I think it, it's always important to um, assess your breathing and, and think about the ways that you are breathing. Um, to, I think if I ever see somebody who I think may have a breathing pattern disorder, I, tr I always try and go for one thing. So whether that's trying to breathe more from the tummy rather than the upper chest or trying to reduce how many breaths a minute somebody's taking or whether it's trying to reduce something that may be a trigger. So, um, for example, trying to reduce down caffeine intake or something. Um, so if you feel that you may have these symptoms and maybe you're not sure, um, it may be worth just trying, trying one thing, having assessing yourself thinking where am I breathing from um, am I really struggling to breathe through my nose or am I really struggling to breathe from my lower sort of abdomen rather than from up here and just trying that one thing um, and seeing where you go from there I think that's really helpful and I think uh, like you guys mentioned earlier it's quite difficult if people's lung health is fluctuating anyway if you get infections you know it can Im impact that as well so I guess it's really helpful to just sort of be aware of uh, the symptoms and, and ways of addressing it. Um, Lynn, I actually have a question for you here, which I don't know whether you've now maybe covered in your session um, about how can we encourage good posture in, in younger children? Um, oh, there's, I guess there's lots of, there's lots of different ways. Um, I think there's, there's lots of challenges when you're, when you're young in that, um, I guess your 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 height changes as you go through. So I think it's it's things like looking at um, where what position you're sitting in for doing your physio. So I think sometimes if you're sitting on big squashy sofas and you can't get your feet on the floor, that can be challenging. Um, so I'm trying to think about you know making it an easy place where you can sit comfortably to do your physio or get into good positions. Um, I guess all just like the general advice. So things about. Um, you know, school bags and things that can really affect your posture. So if you're carrying heavy things, not in a good way, I think technology poses a bit more of a problem. There's lots of things in life that bring our shoulders forward. So um, mobile phones, laptops, anything on the computer, but also huffing and coughing. Um, your, all of your coughing muscles are at the front of your body. So it's easy to bring your shoulders forward. So sometimes it's about doing exercises to help things come back a little bit. Um, yoga is fantastic. And there's lots of good um, kids resources out there now for, for yoga. Um, and even little things like um, if you're someone that breathes through, that can breathe through your nose, but breathes through your mouth without realizing it, sometimes spending some time sitting with your hand on your chin. And um, so either reading, because when you're like this, you have to close, well, unless you're doing, you've got a super strong jaw, you kind of have to um, close your mouth. So just little things like that, building those bits into your routine um, can really, really help. But yeah, it's, postural stuff there's you know all the general sensible things and then if there's anything more specific um your physios can really advise you on a on an individual basis amazing thank you that's really helpful i think um i don't know if the older pcd lot remember i remember being i used to be at, like i used to go to little kids orchestra and i'd play violin they'd come around and poke you in the back with a bow and you think oh you know this is been so much nice that we've moved on from those days no that's really helpful and um, we've got some in the chat actually so um Myra has asked about caffeine. So uh, Liz, you mentioned that caffeine is a stimulant, but how does that affect your breathing? I think that's, it broke my heart when I heard about the caffeine as well, as it did, I'm sure Katie and many other people on this call. So what, how does that affect us and, and what do so, you think about it? I suppose um, one of the things to say is caffeine will affect different people differently. So some people will get away with drinking 10 cups of coffee a day 
and they will be absolutely fine. So don't feel like you've definitely got to stop all your coffee. Um, it will, um, so it, it acts on your central nervous system. So it's going to speed up your heart rate. It's gonna speed up your breathing. Um, and also by speeding up your heart rate, if you're already feeling anxious, it's gonna make you feel more anxious. Um, so then that can then tip over into your breathing again. So it can almost be like a vicious circle. So um, if you're somebody that drinks quite a bit of caffeine or you think that you're quite um, susceptible to the effects of caffeine, it's probably worth trying and seeing if it has an effect. That will break many hearts, I'm sure. Sorry. But very helpful. Sorry. It's very helpful because <laughs> it, it's so, especially Katie, but it's it's so uh, common, isn't it? And it's something that pe maybe people don't really think of. Um, I'm not sure if we still got Hannah on the call. Yes, we have. Hannah, there's a question here as well um, I've had directly about um, anxiety and breathing issues. And uh, they say that breathing issues can cause anxiety, but you know, yes. what way around does it go? And, and yeah talk to us a little bit about that please so anxiety is i mean um to also your breathing is very normal response to an anxious kind of stimulant and um you know it's part of the body's kind of like fight flight you know the way we're made is that actually when we um when we face a, a stressful situation then we our body releases adrenaline and our, our heart rate goes up um our respiratory rate goes up and that's very normal and it should be normal then um, once that um, the trigger of that stress situation sort of goes away, actually for everything to return to normal. But if we do, um, it's quite common, um, you know, we talked about all these strange symptoms. Actually, if you start to develop those symptoms, it's very normal then, uh, or any of those symptoms, they're quite, some of them quite, quite worrying, you know, tingling your fingers and, um, or dizziness or that chest pain, panic attacks. They're all things actually, uh, can cause quite a lot of stress because I mean certainly the tingling the fingers can make you think you've got a neurological problem the gut stuff can make you think you've got irritable bowel or gut problem um, you know they can mimic some quite nasty kind of conditions um, and you can start to kind of think and worry that you have these conditions and actually as when I used to treat adult um, patients not necessarily with, not with PCD but people with um, high ventilation or problems with dysfunctional breathing some of them being around, you know, been seeing loads of specialists. I talked about this in my breakout room, you know, uh, being um, tested for all these things. And um, that would just increase their anxiety. So if they start getting symptoms, and think they think there's something wrong with them and they're having all these tests, then that's going to make them more anxious because they think they've got a kind of nasty, really some nasty condition. And actually that makes the symptoms worse. So you can actually do this, you can spiral downwards quite easily, sort of, um, you know, the the anxiety of thinking you've got of having the symptoms can actually make the symptoms worse so you actually get more anxious and then the symptoms actually can get worse and worse and worse so you can get into this nasty spiral of actually lots, and lots of these, there's a lot of cyclical elements to to um all the kind of symptoms and stuff that's coming up here um and mm. so i can see why it's such a why a lot of people think that you, you know might have a breathing pattern disorder but don't realize and we actually have a question about this in the chat um who uh, so someone who is now pretty sure that they've got one and um, they're very <laughs> testy mouth breather uh they get regularly exhausted sighing yawning and gulping and i tell you what a lot of, i saw those screens when when you said if you sigh a lot and i saw myra like <laughs> and go Do I, you know everyone, yeah we're all sighing um so so obviously it's quite common and and he's saying he doesn't know how to you know genuinely doesn't know how to breathe from the diaphragm or stomach and this common feeling I think for a lot of people what to do when you feel like you're not getting enough air so are there any tips about that kind of you know gulping what you what to do when you feel like you're not not got enough air um I don't know whether Liz do you have a any tips on that or, or anyone actually sorry um I suppose the first thing I'd say is even though you feel like you're not getting enough air don't worry you are getting enough air sure. your lungs are amazing uh -huh. um and you really only need a little bit of your lung to get enough oxygen into your body so although it feels a really uncomfortable feeling um actually you will be getting enough air in it's just your brain saying to your body oh, but I want to take this huge enormous breath and actually you don't need to your brain's just got it a bit wrong um I if you're really struggling to know how to breathe from your tummy um I'd probably say go and speak to a physio um, 
and if you um, go to a PCD centre, which I presume you all do, then um, go and speak to a PCD physio um, and with the wonders of video conferencing and stuff, we, we can talk you through how to do that. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of things today, everyone should really be aware that if, if you think, oh, this might be me, definitely talk about it with your physio. Mm. No, they're not going to think, oh, why is this person bringing this up now? Um, and yeah. I think getting that one-to-one -one advice is really, really yeah. helpful. I I'm think gonna... the other thing... Oh, sorry. sorry. The other thing I was just going to say also, I think reassurance as well is 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 half the problem. Once you realise that you haven't got some nasty condition and this is what it is, you can kind of, the reassurance of knowing that actually does, it, it goes a long way to actually helping you to actually manage it. Absolutely. Thank you. So I'm going to go for one last question now, because I realise we're being very, very mean and taking all of our lovely physios time when they probably want to be eating their dinner. Um, we've got a question for Lynn. So any tips on trying to get a four-year-old to do longer huffs and not really hard quick huffs? And that is the million dollar question, I think. So a good one to end on, definitely. Yeah, I, th I think it's hard because I think when you feel like there's something there, you just want to huff as hard as possible, feeling like you can get rid of it. And yeah, it's it can be really tricky. Um, and I think when you're younger, um, some of it is is reassurance that um, just if, even though the phlegm doesn't immediately come out, that's OK. Um, so changing that expectation and and sometimes it's tapping into what works for the young person. So um some young people um, respond well to kind of animal concepts. So imagining that if you do a big huff, that's like a big dragon huff, but actually we want you to huff like a mouse so that we can't really hear you and you automatically will grade that huff down and do a smaller huff and a more gentle huff. Um, and sort of, you know, almost imagining or having like a baby mouse, a mummy mouse and a daddy mouse, you know, just kind of trying to grade it and putting it into a term where they understand or, Sometimes if we're struggling to teach people to huff harder, we'll use like, um, so like the, the cardboard tubes that you might use when you do your lung function and having a cotton wool ball and trying to blow it and the opposite. So if you're wanting to huff more gently, trying to make the cotton wool ball wobble, um, but not move or just not make it wobble at all so that you're more, more gentle so that you've got that visual sense of what you're doing. So sometimes it's, it's thinking outside the box and trying to find a way to key in with either imagination or with something visual to get them to do what you you know to try and achieve what you're hoping for thank you ever so much um i think that's really useful i like the idea of the mummy mouse but daddy mouse and baby mouse uh, idea <laughs> i think again i think us adults are going to be getting very uh, creative in the weeks to come um guys thank you ever so much i know this has been a really useful session for everyone um i realize we haven't got through all the questions but um hopefully if you if you don't mind we will uh, email you maybe a few uh, follow-up questions uh that we can send around to people and also some resources so um then hannah liz and uh, lynn have provided some resources that we are going to send out to you i am going to send that out to you tomorrow so that's that will be my <laughs> not this evening but tomorrow but um yeah thank you ever so much everyone for coming and especially to our physios who uh, we would be pretty miserable without you and you're very very important in all of our lives um, so it's great to have you here giving us your top tips today um, I really hope that everyone has a great evening and I realize that for some people this is the end of the shielding period or the official shielding period so I hope for those that are eligible that you've had your vaccines and that you're doing okay um, if not if you haven't please do get in touch and uh, we're really keen to make sure everyone's sort of safe and feeling okay at the moment so we are here if you need us but I will leave it um, with our lovely physios just to say thank you to you guys and um, we look forward to seeing you soon and we will be putting all of this on our YouTube channel as well for everyone to uh, take another look at and remind themselves so have a great evening everyone